So anyways, let's go out on video chat now. I'm very interested to see where he's situated today. I hope he's at his desk. No, he's not. I thought he'd have a Stanley Cup in the background. Craig Button, sir, how are you doing this morning? I am good, Rod. Uh, I am at my desk. Oh, look at that. Yeah. yeah. Did you just work out? Yeah. No, uh, my, you got to schedule your workouts. Uh, we're still open here for exercise in uh, uh, Alberta, so but you got to schedule them. So my my scheduled workout today is eleven o'clock. You know what I like about it? It's an hour time slot. Very few people in the gym, and it focuses you on getting in and getting out. No lingering. I kind of <laughs> like that. But uh, at this, yeah, yeah I should have yeah, put up there. the Stanley Cup in the background. Well, you're there to work out, right? Not visit. That's the whole idea. But uh, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. I get it. Craig, I got a lot of things to to get through with you. But the number one thing for me is Red Deer. Obviously, I'm watching you and uh, Rashog's comments every day, your coverage. And Ryan said, made it very clear, this is not a bubble in Red Deer that the Team Canada is going through. But, you know, he's never really explained it. What is the setup there in Red Deer for Team Canada? Well, uh, the way I've... uh compared it, Rod, is is that when phase two of the NHL return to play began, it was about, uh, you know, trying to bring the players into the facilities, try to, you know, see where they're at. And we saw in the phase two return to play the NHL, there was some positive tests with players and staff and even some facilities got shut down for a short period of time. So, you know, that was the initial phase. Uh, you know, now they're into phase three. And phase three now, it's locked down and the testing is going to be, uh, you know, they have to, every country now is in phase three where they have to have uh, three negative tests in the next five days before uh, going to Edmonton and being in the bubble where they'll be tested regularly. So, you know, what what happened in Red Deer and, you know, uh, Alberta Health Services who have, uh, you know, worked very closely with Hockey Canada with respect to guidance with the camp said it's not unexpected what occurred you know because you're bringing in players and people from a lot of different areas and but if you don't get it in under control with a certain amount of time lag ahead of the tournament you're, you're going to run the risk and run a greater risk of that virus going into the bubble and that was the whole that was one of the most significant ideas of having the camp start when it did and having it be so long i mean yesterday three u.s players uh, because of COVID protocols, uh, had to uh, were not uh, able to uh, travel to Michigan for the beginning of the USA camp, and, and they will not be able to participate in the World Junior camp because of uh, because of the COVID protocols. William Eklund tested positive in Sweden. He's another one now not able to uh, participate in the World Junior. So we're into that phase now because it's such a short tournament that if you if if you test positive or there's a, t- a positive case. You're out. You're, you're, there's no wait for a few days and see what happens. You're out. So, you know, they're, trying, they're, they're locking it down uh, a lot more seriously beginning today with uh, the teams going into Edmonton next Sunday on the 13th uh, to enter the bubble. How often are you getting asked if the World Juniors is going to be played on a daily basis? Because people are writing in wanting me to ask you that. Are you, how many times a day are you getting it? Well, all the time, Rod. And, you know, it's a, it, you know, given what, you know, what's happening across the country, what's happening across the world with uh, COVID-19, it, it's a question that uh, should be asked. And, you know, uh, when the NHL had their return to play, there was a lot of questions, you know, what was, what was going to happen? You know, uh, you know, what are the chances of them finishing what they start? I think the same questions are normal and natural uh, heading into the World Junior Tournament. And, and that's why beginning today, not beginning today, but, you know, in, in the days leading up to today, it's getting tighter. The restrictions uh, around the teams are a lot more tighter. The testing is now, uh, you know, in place, you know, with those mandatory three tests, negative tests before you can enter the bubble. So, you know, we've reached this point and there hasn't been, you know, any, what I would say within the hockey community for the World Junior Tournament, there hasn't been any alarm bells go off. And now what you hope is that you get through this week and then as they come into the into the bubble, they're going to have to test negative for four consecutive days before they can open up in the bubble and start to participate and practice and, and mingle again. So the, the, there's this phase that they're going through, and then there's going to be the next phase. So 
you know, we could put percentages on it, uh, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of things that are out of the control. And I think that everybody, the IIHF, Hockey Canada, uh, the Edmonton organizers are doing everything they can to, to mitigate against the risk. And some of that risk is out of their hands, but they can only control what they can control. And I, I really think everybody's doing a terrific job, uh, you know, right around the world. Well, the funny thing is, you know, Sammy Costantino, who you know well, was on with us last week and said, you know, you got to get 450 players and staff in from all around the world. But, he, you know, he understands. It's not like it's not being worked on. We don't see it. People think it's just willy-nilly. Let's hope it happens. And you're right. It, you know, the IIHF and the officials are working around the clock to ensure that it happens. How big of a blow was it to Team Canada's chances at winning of Alexi Lafreniere being told, uh, or Team Canada being told that the Rangers won't release him? I, I would say, uh, Rod, that it, it, minimal to none. You know, the, the expectation if, the, if there was an NHL season, Alexi Lafreniere wouldn't be there. Would it have enhanced uh, their their gold medal chances? Yeah, it would be ridiculous to say it wouldn't enhance it, but it doesn't minimize it. This this Team Canada is one of the most talented groups of players, and I'm talking about the entire player pool. Once you get into the tournament, time will tell how good they are. They're going to have to prove that they're capable of competing for a gold medal, and uh, ultimately, if they do win a gold medal, they'll be judged on that. But this is a very, very talented group of players uh, that – you know, is going to form a, a very, very competent uh, team. And uh, I, there's no question in my mind that they're going to compete for a gold medal. And I, I, I really believe we're going to get a repeat of last year's gold medal game. You know, as long as there's no kind of real, uh, what, what I would call significant changes to, to the teams with respect to COVID, I think it'll be Canada rushing the gold medal. I think they're the two best teams in this tournament. Can't, can't wait to get it going. Now, here's a question you probably don't get a lot. We're debating around here how many points Connor Bedard will have in his exceptional player season, which it looks like will face off January 8th. I'm saying a point a game. My friends are saying I'm crazy. Tavares and McDavid did it, Craig, when they were 15, point a game, over a point a game actually in the OHL. What do you think the expectation should be for Connor Bedard here? Uh, you know, it's it, it, it's interesting because, you know, John John and Connor were a little bit more physically mature than Connor. So what I would suggest is, you know, if, if he can get 0.75 points a game, uh, remember, he hasn't played a meaningful game since uh, last spring. I, I shouldn't say that. He did play some games in the in the Swedish J20 league, and he, and, he, and he did quite well, which is a very, very good junior league. But, you know, if he can do 0.75, 0. 0.8 points per game, which isn't far off a point a game, I, I think that at the outset that that would be really good because he's a very smart and very talented player. What I would say, Rod, is – he might have less points per game in, in whatever the season is, so I'm going to break it into two halves, whether that's 40 games, you got 20, 20, where I would, I would expect him to be able to move closer to a pointy game once he gets to the second half of the season and starts to get his uh, feet uh, a little more uh, comfortable playing in the league. Well, Dave Struess, the coach, has said he sat right in this bunker and said they're playing him regular shift. He's going to be running the power plays, probably going to have him kill him penalties too. What the heck? So he's going to play him till his tongue hangs out as much as he can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> and from what I understand, he can take it. Physically, he can't. And uh, Craig, in the time that we have left, if you don't mind, I drop your name here so much. Uh, if you wouldn't mind talking about my dad, and my brothers listened every day as well. Uh, Darren, Darren came down to my dad's memorial and funeral. He never met my dad. And in the lobby of the Milestone Rank, there was a card from you. You had handwritten to all the staff a thank you when you guys won the Stanley Cup for dad's contributions. Uh, so we displayed that as a family. Would you mind speaking about Jim Peterson, if you don't mind? Well, it's hard to speak about Jim if I don't speak about Judy as well, because uh, your mom and dad are spe we're special people. And, you know, you know, you think about your dad and, you know, a, a, a farmer from Milestone, Saskatchewan, right? And, I mean, he, he cared. He loved his family. I mean, he loved his, his boys. He loved his wife. But he loved helping people. And so many of the things, I mean, Jim was not only a, a, a wonderful scout and a dedicated scout. He, he genuinely wanted to see everybody succeed. <laughs> it didn't matter who you were or what you were. And... You, 
you know this, and maybe a lot of people don't know, but Jim went to the Saskatchewan Midget AAA League, and he talked to all the teams in the league and tried to help them understand, you know, about how to, how, how to deal with the challenges, you know, that you're going to be facing, you know, off the ice. You know, he did it in the, in the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League, and his contacts in the Western Hockey League were, were tremendous. So, I mean, he, he, he was phenomenal in terms of his scouting, and that really, really understates how important he was to so many young players and how much support he lended to them in helping them not understand what kind of challenges they may face, helping them overcome some of the challenges they were facing and providing tremendous resources, not just to the players and their families, but also to the coaches and the managers in, 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 those, in, in those places. Because parents are sending their kids away and they're sending their kids away to pursue a dream. And, you know, as a parent, you want to ensure that, you know, your, your, your kid is going to be taken care of and he's going to have all the opportunities. Well, your dad was an instrumental part of that for kids that were going away to play midget AAA or going to play in the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League or coming into the Western Hockey League. I mean, yeah, he, he, he had a terrific eye for talent and certainly provided a lot, a lot of good insight uh, to us in our scouting efforts in Dallas and contributed a lot of uh, uh, great uh, intelligence to the players we selected. But you know, far greater in terms of helping people, you know, try to be at their very best, no, no matter what the challenges were. He was always there for you, always. Well, I appreciate that, Craig. And the interesting thing that my brothers and I have talked about, we didn't even realize till after he was gone, there wasn't a player in Saskatchewan that he hadn't shaken their hand and looked in their eye oh. and had a conversation with. And I know what that means to a guy like you when you're trying to uh, draft somebody or sign somebody. Well, you, you know, Rod, like... You know, it's interesting, and I'm going to bring this up. You know, the Mitchell Miller case, uh, you know, Mitchell, who was drafted by the Arizona Coyotes, uh, who was who was found guilty of, of, of abuse, a bullying of, of, of a young uh, uh, disabled kid in Michigan. And we saw what happened. You know, uh, Michigan, uh, Arizona uh, renounced the rights to him. Uh, North Dakota University said, you're not going to play for our hockey team. And a lot of people say, you know, like, how did they not know? Well, I'll tell you this. I asked myself the same question because your father knew. Your father knew all those kids. He knew every single kid. It didn't matter who you asked about. He, he was thorough. I, I'm going to share this story. So give me a second here. Sure. And you'll recall, you'll recall this, Rod. And, and so when I sit here and I see people say we didn't know and you didn't check into it, that's an epic fail, epic fail. And there was no way, and I'm, people say, oh, what you got to do now? We were doing it in the 90s, and your dad was instrumental in that. Jeff Reeson, in the 1994 draft, so in, in the spring of 1993, not the spring, uh, the fall, uh, a very prominent scout in the NHL had gone in to see Jeff Reeson play in Regina. Now, keep in mind, he had scored 50 goals as a 16-year-old. He was a top player. And the commentary coming out, oh, this Jeff Reeson, you would never want him. You know, he's, he's a, he, he doesn't work hard. He's not competitive. And really assailed him, uh, his character, uh, with respect. Now, now it, it, was, it was a different type of competitiveness, but really assailed Jeff Reeson. Anyway, fast forward. Jeff has a terrific year. We're coming to the, we're picking 20th in the draft. And we're sitting there, we're going, Jeff Friesen might fall. Jeff Friesen might fall in the draft. And, you know, we're going, we, we better do our work on this. And because we never really spent an inordinate amount of time on players that were going to go in the top part of the draft. We spent the time on the players that we were looking at. We knew about them. Well, guess where it started? It started right with your dad, and your dad was very clear, talking to all the people around the Regina Pats organization, the teachers, the bill, everybody. There wasn't one, not the tiniest bit that could be corroborated that was negative about Jeff Reeson. In fact, it was exactly the opposite. So here we are, fully satisfied. I don't know how many other teams you know, didn't go and do the work because he went 11th. He shouldn't have gone 11th in that draft. He should have gone much higher. We're picking 20th thinking he might fall to us. But that was just a perfect example of saying, we are not going to leave any stone unturned. 
And your father never left any stone unturned. <laughs> no, he did not. And that's what he taught me. And 893 <laughs> games later for Jeff Fries and uh, pretty good yeah. NHL career. Uh, Craig, I'll let you go. Your phone's going off. I know you're a busy guy, but uh, hey, we're following no, everything you're doing. My phone's not going off. Something my was going phone's off. not going off. Went, was that the doorbell? No, or I don't think so. <laughs> what oh, that's you what it was, yeah. <laughs> we got one of those rings, so when people j- walk by, we get a little bit of the ring. That's what you're hearing. Sorry, but I okay. want to know why are, wh- why are you uh, why are you celebrating the NFL so much? Don't you know it's hurting the CFL? <laughs> I know you saw that <laughs> when I was coming on the air, huh? Oh God! <laughs> Welcome to this side of the mic. Listen, th- th- why are you been in the media so long, man? You're on the dark side. You uh, <laughs> like is it because you can sleep at? You get the heap of scorn that we get over here. I mean, are you going to stay in this forever? Or are you going back to working for a team one day? What do you think? I don't know. I'd love to work for a team. I think it's special. But I have thoroughly enjoyed, you know, if you want to call it the dark side, I, I've been, I've thoroughly enjoyed being here. And, you know, what, what amazes me too, Rod, like for people to accuse you of that, like I, I don't know, like there might be some people that are as big a CFL supporter as Rod Peterson. I don't know of anybody that's bigger. So, you know, for, for, for people to, to, to suggest that you're hurt in the CFL, oh, boy, that, that, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, the gloves are off. I'm here to fight for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can use the help. Craig, and I got your back as well, my friend. Look, I appreciate it. Have a great workout and uh, keep in touch. And happy holidays. Merry Christmas. It's always good to see you. Yeah, same to you, you know, and Rod, and, uh, you know, love the Peterson family. Your, your, your mom and dad were special people, and uh, the apples don't fall far from the tree. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. Craig Button uh, joining us from Calgary. And by the way, an interesting thing, my dad's funeral, as you know, was held in the rink, filled yeah. the rink, my mom's quiet little country church. <laughs> so Craig noticed that. My mom always just staying in the shadows, quiet. She was good with that. It's what she wanted. Yeah. Country church, you know, it was packed too. But dad, hey, <laughs> you know, bring all the hockey people out and the cowboys and the farmers. So, uh, yeah, that was awesome, Craig. Thanks for the kind words. You're watching Rod Peterson On Demand. For more of the Rod Peterson Show, visit rodpeterson.com or follow Rod Peterson on social media.